Hello everybody and thank you for joining the Realty One Stop YouTube channel. I am here today to make a four part video where I'm going to break down four steps to financial freedom. And when I say financial freedom, I mean that you create enough passive income or semi-passive income to replace your current job, career, uh, business income if that's what you're doing. Um, so. To start us off, uh, I want to cover the basics of understanding financial literacy. Okay, so this is the first and most important step to building a financial foundation that will allow you to become financially free. So without this, you're not gonna be able to grow from here, you're not gonna be able to invest and grow your income um, because you don't have that financial education as a basis. So that's step one, and I'm gonna outline uh, some of the things that I went through and that I learned and some things I recommend for anyone who is following me to do if you want to take that journey from where you're at now to that level one financial freedom, which I'll explain in more detail later. So to become financially liter literate, you have to understand money. So if you don't understand money, you are starting at such a disadvantage that you're not going to be able to do the things necessary to become wealthy or financially free. Uh, and I'm speaking from experience because I was someone who grew up in a middle class household that we didn't really talk about money a lot. Um, I did not have any sophisticated financial understanding. I didn't come from a family of investors or entrepreneurs that really understood how wealth and finances and business work and how they're all intertwined. Um, so this was something I very much had to take upon myself to really understand in my early 20s. Um, so, you know, I, I, I didn't come from some advantaged place as far as, you know, a family that, that really set me down and explained to me how uh, finances work. So if you're in that position, if you feel like you don't really under, understand or have a sophisticated understanding of how finances work, financial literacy, uh, that's okay because that's where I started at. And um, you can make great strides in short, shorter amount of times than you might think um, if you take the steps now to, to become educated and learn. And if you're watching this video, then hopefully that's your motivation. So I'm gonna recommend a couple books that I used in the beginning to get started, okay? So the first one is Total Money Makeover by uh, Dave Ramsey, which hopefully you've heard of, but if you haven't, check him out. Um, Dave Ramsey has a lot of insight into personal finance, some of which I agree with. I don't agree with all of it, and and you know I could make a separate video really breaking down his philosophy. Um, but just understand that he does have a ton of useful information, and it is useful information for the wide variety of people in America or around the world, right? So his goal is to capture the widest audience possible and kind of dumb information down to the lowest common denominator, meaning that anyone who can read and picks up his books or listens to his radio show will understand where he's coming from and understand the, you know, he calls it the baby steps, which they're literally, you know, individual baby steps that he recommends everyone take. Um, so that's a great resource to get a base understanding, but I'm hoping that if you're following me and if you're going to listen to my advice, that you're a little bit more sophisticated than the lowest common denominator, right? So I'm hoping that um, you know my audience will be a little bit more sophisticated where we can curtail that information where it's actually the most beneficial and not just you know the easiest to understand. So I try to maximize uh, your, your benefit in a shorter amount of time financially. And that's what I'm gonna talk about. Uh, another book that I recommend everybody read is Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Hopefully you've heard of it. I mean, it's like one of the greatest selling real estate or business books in the world. Um, it's not really specific to real estate, but the reason why I like that book and I recommend it to everybody who's starting on their financial freedom journey is because it is like the baseline understanding of how money works. It's told in a really interesting story. Most people get sucked into it and they can read it in like three or four or five hours. Um, I've read it many times over and it really just talks about Robert Kiyosaki as a child and how he learned about money through following both of his different uh, father figures in his life. Um, that's why he has the rich dad and the poor dad. So 
I think that's a great book for everybody to read. I'll, I'm going to link to both of those in the uh, description of the video here, just in case you haven't heard of them or haven't uh, read them. I'll, I'll give you a link just to uh, pick it up if you're interested. Um, <clears throat> once you've read those, that should give you a baseline understanding of what I'm talking about in this video. Um, if you're ahead of that, great. I'm going to get into some more you know, sophisticated uh, strategies here. Um, Moving right along into that, the next thing that I would recommend everybody do is have a written budget, okay? This is something that Dave Ramsey will talk about as well, and it's real simple. And I don't care how you do it. There's a lot of different ways, and I'll go over some of those. But you want to track in writing your income from whatever jobs or businesses you have, all of your expenses that go out, you know, your taxes, your mortgage, your insurance, your gas, every single thing you spend your money on every week or month. And you want to understand what's coming in and what's going out, okay? There's a lot of different sophisticated strategies on how to do that. I'm not going to get into that in this video, but just understand that budgeting is one of the most important things you can do when you're trying to begin a financial freedom journey. Because if you don't know where your money's going, you're never going to learn how to save it or grow it, okay? Um, there's a lot of apps that, that'll help you track those. Um, I think Dave Ramsey actually has one. I think it's called um, Every Dollar or something like that. Um, I'll try to find a link for that and put it in here as well. Um, you know, you don't have to use that one, but there's a ton of free apps out there for your phone, on your computer. You can use spreadsheets. You can use a notepad or a ledger. Um, I mean, it, it's not really, what it's not important how you do it. It's just important that you do it because if you're the type of person who, you know, runs out of money every month and doesn't know how they're going to pay their bills, budgeting is a huge step in the right direction. Okay. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is credit. Okay. I, I've heard a lot of things throughout my lifetime about your credit score and, you know, what credit is and why it's important. And if you do follow Dave Ramsey, then you're going to listen to him tell you that, you know, credit is the devil. You never want credit cards. You never want to have credit. Um, and you know, he basically advises everybody pay cash for everything. Again, I don't follow that philosophy at all. I think credit is a tool that should be used appropriately. And it's very important to have good credit and understand how your credit score works and how it impacts your financial life. Um, so I think it's something that everyone should use and they should use it correctly. Um, you know, the basic understanding, if you have no idea how credit score works is that your credit score is tracked by independent credit bureaus that look at your spending habits over a long period of time. So the longer you have a credit score, the easier it is to improve it. Okay, when you only have lines of credit for a short amount of time, it's really difficult to, to get a high credit score and it also will go down very quickly if you make any mistakes. Okay, so credit is kind of a long picture of your financial behavior. Um, I don't wanna to get too into the weeds with, with the credit score on this particular video, but just understand that Having credit at a young age is a very important tool that you will need to use later if you want to grow wealth in any short period of time, okay? Um, so don't be afraid of it. Use it responsibly. I'm happy to make more videos on specific strategies with that later. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to leave it in the comments. Um, but just understand that credit is not a bad, evil thing, and you shouldn't be afraid of it, okay? Uh, and, and when you're learning about credit, there's two different types of, of credit that you should understand, okay? And they're very different and they do different things, okay? And there is a such thing as bad credit and a such thing as good credit. Rich Dad Poor Dad talks about this a lot and it's a very good concept to take away from that book, but I'll briefly um, cover some of the ideas that, that I personally live by, okay? Good debt, to me, is any credit that creates income or produces assets, okay? So what that means is if you are getting a mortgage on an investment property that is cash flowing and pays you money every month in, 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 in and above any expenses um, or liabilities you have on that property, then that is good debt, meaning that is debt that creates income for you. Um, another example might be, let's just say you had a line of credit and it was a $100,000 line of credit that you pay 3% interest on, okay? If you were doing private lending on that line of credit for a 10% return or 10% interest on that money, and you are now making a 7% spread on that line of credit, that is good debt. That is income producing debt, okay? Um, bad debt would be 
credit card debt, student loan debt, personal automobile debt, um, even a primary house that does not produce income is bad debt. I'm not saying that means you shouldn't do it. What I'm saying is that is a liability that you must pay on every month or you would you know, potentially lose your house, right? So it is, it is personal debt that does not produce income. That's all I want you to understand from this video. It either makes you money or it costs you money. That's it. So good debt, bad debt, okay? Um, so when you're looking at you know building your financial literacy, you want to get rid of that bad debt as soon as you possibly can. When I started my journey at 25 years old, the first thing I did was I listed all my debts in order, and this is something Dave Ramsey teaches, it's called the snowball, and I looked at all my highest interest debt, and I started paying them off in the order of highest interest to lowest interest as fast as I possibly could. I had some medical debt, I had, some, I had an automobile debt, um, I had like four or five or six things I had to pay off, okay? And I, and I did those in order of highest interest to lowest. Typically, if you have any credit card debt, consumer debt, that is going to be the highest interest. I mean, that can go all the way up to like 28% interest, okay? So paying those off or refinancing those into a lower interest debt is one of the most important first things you can do on your financial freedom journey, okay? Because to get to a position that we're gonna talk about in the next videos that are gonna come after this one, you have to get to a bare minimum of even net worth. And what I mean by that in net worth is all of your assets, so everything you own, the value of everything you own in this world, minus any liabilities, that means debt, you know, money owed to, to people or vendors or, or you know, whoever, uh, you know, the positive minus the negative, that gives you a number. And that sometimes for a lot of people, that's a negative number. That means you have a negative net worth, okay? You don't want to be in a negative net worth position when you're trying to build wealth and reach financial freedom. And the reason why is because, well, first of all, net worth is one of the most misunderstood topics. I see people talk about it all the time on the internet and most people don't understand it at all, okay? You know, I'm going to use Jeff Bezos as the famous example, right? You know, when people talk about Jeff Bezos and they get mad that he's worth, you know, $200 billion, you know, when they talk about his net worth or when they talk about $200 billion, they're talking about his net worth. Okay. So that doesn't mean he has $200 billion sitting in the bank. That means that all of his assets, which is primarily ownership in, you know, Amazon stock minus his liabilities, you know, he's, you know, obviously the number changes daily based on stock price, but somewhere in the neighborhood of 200, you know, plus billion dollars. Um, and people get upset about that and that's a whole different discussion. But the point being that net worth is an important tool in wealth generation because your net worth allows you to leverage that number for growth. And obviously we'll talk more about that later, but all I want you to understand with this video is that your net worth is important. And if you're trying to start a financial freedom journey from a place of high credit card debt, high consumer debt, you know, auto loans, high interest loans, student loans, you're at a massive disadvantage because you're not able to start building that financial foundation that, that we're talking about uh, when you're in such a weak financial position, okay? So it's important to understand this stuff and to start growing with these step one, you know, uh, levels to get to the next point that we're going to talk about. Okay, saving money is also a great strategy, right? I mean, I hear people talk all, all the time, New Year's resolutions, you know, I'm gonna quit going to Starbucks, I'm gonna save that, you know, 10 bucks a day I'm wasting on this or that, or I'm gonna quit eating out, I'm gonna pack my lunch to work because I'm gonna save 10 bucks every day, or whatever that is. And look, saving money is, is important. So I'm not trying to take away anything from, you know, uh, people who are out there trying to save. What I want you to understand, though, is that Typically what people really spend a lot of time and effort on trying to save money is making such a small dent in their financial picture that it may not even be worth the time or effort they're putting into it. And what I mean by that is if you're making $50,000 a year, okay, and you're trying to save 10 bucks a day by not eating out, all right, if you work 300 days a year, you're saving $3,000 and that's great. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that, okay? But the problem is that $3,000 you saved is not going to change your financial picture 
in enough of a meaningful way that you're going to reach financial freedom in a significantly faster time because of that. And why I want you to understand that is because there are other things you can do that are going to be much more impactful to your financial picture than worrying about saving 10 bucks a day. Okay. So I'm not saying don't do it, but what I'm saying is understand that it is not the most important thing you can do. Okay. Now, David Green is a, an investor and financial um, literacy guy that I follow. If you're, if you're not following David Green, you should definitely check him out. He's the host of the Bigger Pockets podcast now, which I recommend you guys look at as well. Um, but David Green had a really good philosophy on this, and I think it's important for people to understand. Okay, He talks about, when it comes to financial literacy, understanding offense versus defense. So what we just talked about, saving that 10 bucks a day on a cup of coffee or, or packing lunch or whatever that is, that is a defensive measure when it comes to finances, right? Um, you already have X amount of income, whatever that number is, and you're trying to save now 10 bucks a day or 3,000 bucks a year like we just explained. Well, defense only goes so far because you know no matter what your income is, you can only save so much money. You're gonna have housing expenses, you're gonna have gas, you're gonna have insurance. Like There's a lot of fixed costs that you have to have to survive and that number that your defensive number and what you're able to save is only going to go so far. Now, on the flip side of that, your offensive number, and think of that as your income, if you have any businesses, if you have side hustles, if you have any investments, all of that income that you generate is your offensive abilities, okay? You are able to leverage that number so much more significantly than your defensive number, okay? And when you focus your energies on that, instead of saving the 10 bucks a day on coffee or packing lunch, you can have such a greater impact on your financial picture, okay? It's, it's easier, honestly, and I know this may sound difficult for people you know, who, who don't understand it, but it is easier to grow your income by $3,000 a year than it is to save $3,000 a year when you're already living on pretty minimal expenses, okay? Um, now, you know, if you're in a million dollar house and you can't afford it and you're spending $10,000 a month on a mortgage, of course you could sell that house and go, you know, pay $1,500 a month in a mortgage and, and, and save that difference. And that's a huge, you know, defensive gain of nine or $8,500. So I'm not saying that there aren't situations in which being defensive is a good strategy. I just want you to understand that levering the offensive abilities and generating more income is typically easier and more impactful than trying to penny pinch on the other side, okay? And an important concept to get with this is understanding your dollar per hour worth, okay? There's a lot of financial people that talk about this and it's something that I did learn very early on in my financial journey, okay? And what I mean by that is, let's just say you are a banker, okay? And you're making 20 bucks an hour as a bank teller, okay? That is kind of your baseline of income, right? You are paid $20 an hour for whatever your job is, and that is your baseline. So what that means is when you decide to do anything and you're, you're spending time doing anything, whether that's house chores or going to the grocery store or cutting your grass, whatever that is, you have to look at it from a financial position of, what does this cost for this task to do? And is there a way for me to spend my time in a more impactful way financially? Okay. Now, of course, I'm not talking about spending time with your friends, your family. I'm not talking about, you know, making your entire life robotic of, okay, well, how much money can I make per hour? That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is when you have the option to do things you don't want to do, Okay, and cutting grass is a perfect example in my own life. I can't stand cutting grass. I cut grass as a kid. I didn't like it then. And I think at like 24 or 25, I made the decision, I am done cutting grass and I have never cut grass since then, okay? So what that looked like for me was I can pay somebody to come cut my grass 30 bucks a week or whatever it was at the time. And can I do something in my life that is more impactful than 30 bucks to save two hours, let's say, cutting my grass, okay? And for me, at, at the time I was a police officer, I knew that I could go work. Well, we had a, we had something called a traffic car. I could go work a traffic car and make 50 bucks an hour in one hour of working traffic 
and not have to spend two hours cutting my grass to save 30 bucks, okay? That concept is super important to understand because when you start looking at your life through that lens of what does this cost me per hour, is there a more meaningful, more impactful way I can use that time? It will change how you look at everything, okay? So for like here, for example, here's just some examples of things that I don't personally do anymore because I spend my time in more impactful ways. I don't cut the grass. I don't, you know, do certain house chores. You know, I, ha I have a cleaner that does certain uh, house chores for us. Um, a lot of stuff that my assistant helps me with is things that uh, I can take that time I'm saving now by paying her to do things and use that on more meaningful tasks like making these YouTube videos. Um, so those are just some examples of my life of things I want you to think about. And I'm not saying at this point, you know, if you're just starting out on this journey and you're working, you know, a, a minimum wage job or a low income job, you may not be at a point where it makes sense to offload anything. But what I want you to understand is that when you grow your income and you start growing your wealth, these are important things you have to look at about your time because your time is the most valuable asset you have. Okay. And when we're talking about the, um, you know, offense versus defense idea, okay, there's something that, that if we're going to look at defensive measures, there are ways that you can make those huge impacts financially, okay? And what I want you to think about is that if, similar to the example I just gave. If you have a million dollar house and you're paying $10,000 every month in a mortgage, there are certainly places you could live in whatever market you're in that are probably cheaper than that. Certainly here in you know the Midwest and Cincinnati where I am, okay? So one concept that is thrown around a lot in the real estate, investing, and financial freedom place is house hacking. House hacking simply means where you live in a property and you reduce your expenses by either renting out rooms of that house, let's say if it's a single family, or you Airbnb part of that house if it's a, a you know able to be rented as a short-term rental, or if it's a traditional duplex, triplex, fourplex, you can rent the other apartments out and reduce your expenses in the apartment that you live in. Okay, that's house hacking. That is something I recommend to almost all inspiring financial freedom advocates, okay? The reason why is because your living expenses is typically your number one expense. It should be your number one expense, um, especially if you're just starting out. So if you can take your $1,500 that you spend every month in rent and take that down to 500 or even a negative number, meaning you're getting paid to live in a place, that is a massive impact on your financial position. Right? If you could add another $2,000 a month to your income because you're no longer saving or you're no longer spending that on your rent um, or even a mortgage, let's say in a house that you can't house hack, that is a massive shift to the positive category in your financial picture. Okay, And that will go a long way in, in ramping up this journey to financial freedom. Because the goal of all of this, guys, is you want your passive or semi-passive income to be greater than your expenses. That's all it is, right? When I set out on this journey for myself six years ago, I had a goal to replace my W-2 income as a police officer, which I was bringing home roughly like 3,600 bucks every month. Okay, that was roughly my take-home pay. After all my you know pension and medical and everything came out of my check, I was netting like 1,800 bucks every two weeks. Okay. And that's, and that's, you know, that's not a bad living. I'm not, I'm not trying to scoff at that because that is a, you know, worked out to like $70,000 a year, which is a great income. I mean, that, that's more than a lot of people make. Okay. But I knew that if I started saving my money, getting out of all of my bad debts we just talked about, and I started growing my wealth, I knew I could create more passive income than $70,000 a year. Okay. So my initial goal was $4,000 a month in cash flow, and I hit that last year, which is why I left my job. So now I have that level one financial freedom, which all that means is that my, my passive income coming in from my rentals is above my living expenses. So part of that is keeping those living expenses as low as you possibly can, because if you raise that up, if your living expenses are $8,000 a month, that is going to add a ton of time, work, and effort to try to pass that in passive income. Um, you know, so so it's really important that while you're on this journey, to do everything you can 
to keep those living expenses as low as possible. And once you hit that level one financial freedom, then you can keep ratcheting it up higher and higher until you get to a point where if you want, you know, to, to set your goal for ten or twenty thousand dollars a month of passive income, that's great, and that's obviously going to give you a much more fulfilling lifestyle. Um, but hitting that level one goal is the first and most important step, and that's what we're talking about here. So when it comes to any uh, financial, you know, uh, strategy, time is the biggest factor that we can look at. Okay, um, and this is something that you know I. I've thought about a lot and I want to somehow convey it to you guys. Um, the best time to start this journey was yesterday, right? So if you didn't start yesterday, then today is the best time. And I don't care how old you are, you know, obviously if you are, you know, 18, 19, 20 years old, that is the best time to become financially literate. Um, but if you're 60 years old, starting now is going to put you in a better position than if you start when you're 80 years old. Okay. So it's very important that no matter how old, how old you are, no matter what financial position you're in, you need to start now because time is of the essence. Okay. Wealth grows slowly over time. There is no such thing as a get rich quick scheme. You know, you can get lucky and hit the lottery, but that's like a one in a million chance, right? The only way I know how to do this consistently and reliably is slowly over time. That's what we're talking about. That's what I did. And I'm not saying you have to do this for 30, 40 years. Yeah, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying to avoid having to work 30 or 40 years in your job that you may or may not like, you have to be more aggressive. You have to do the things that I'm talking about here. And that will allow you to change your financial picture in 5, 10, 15 years, accelerate that timeline. So even if you're 30 years old or 40 years old, you could still retire and hit that passive income number that will allow you to have financial freedom at a much younger age than the path you're on now, right? The trajectory you're on now to work till you're 62 or 65 or 70 or whatever they decide to raise the retirement age to, which it's only going to go up. So I want you to think about that, that starting now is the most important factor. It is the most important thing you can do to change your life. And if you've watched this long, I really appreciate it. Um, again, this was part one of a four part video where we're going to outline all the different strategies that I, uh, have used and that I recommend other people use to grow your wealth, hit financial freedom. Um, so the next video we'll be talking about how we grow our income, how we get to a different financial place where you can raise those levels on the offensive side that we talked about. Um, the, the third video, we're going to talk about how to invest that money and how to grow your net worth. In the last step, in the fourth video, we're going to talk about hitting that level one financial freedom and how to you know, exponentially grow your wealth from that point. So I hope you guys uh, enjoyed the video. Um, please, if you got any value from this, subscribe, like it. If you have suggestions on any other content you would like to see, please leave me a comment or shoot me a message. Um, I want to make videos that are specifically um, addressing the questions that you guys have as, as the audience. Um, and again, subscribe and look forward to those uh, next three videos that will be coming out soon. Thank you.